Thanks everyone for coming. Um, I am Jonathan Stark. I'm a mobile consultant and web evangelist based in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. And I uh, am a little bit of a, a religious zealot about um, wireless computing and what it's doing to transform society. And today we're going to talk about how that, uh, how responsive web design kind of interacts with um, the future coming zombie apocalypse of connected devices that uh, I think everyone sees on the horizon. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, the OneWeb philosophy and the benefits of it, uh, the mechanics of media queries, uh, some thoughts about code organization and best practices, uh, how to add support for adaptive images in the context of responsive web design, and uh, thoughts on fallback techniques for older browsers. All right, so let's jump right in. So first, one web. So it's no longer safe to assume that uh, our visitors or the visitors to your website are sitting in front of a big monitor with a keyboard and a mouse attached. Uh, it's predicted that by 2015, uh, traffic to the Internet will be um, more than 50% coming from smartphones and uh, other portable devices, and that the desktop will basically become less and less uh, of the primary access to the Internet. So with this, uh, with this coming down the pipe, we need to adopt future-friendly strategies that are going to allow our content to make it out to people in whatever context that they find themselves and on whatever device they're using. So anytime, anywhere, on anything. Tim Berners-Lee obviously gets this, um, he's, and, and the quote here I think is great. The web is critical not merely to the digital revolution but to our continued prosperity and even our liberty. Like democracy itself, it needs defending. Part of what he's talking about there has to do with uh, this is sort of, I think it's more than a trend, it's almost become an anti-pattern in my opinion, uh, the M dot example.com or m.cnn or m.guardian.co.uk. Uh, this is a technique that's been used to provide an experience for, um, for mobile users that is different from the desktop users. So as an example, I do have the uh, screenshot of the, the Guardian uh, site viewed on a desktop and then the same site viewed on mobile. And it's, it's the same article, but uh, it's kind of small. Uh, but in the URL, the difference is that the, the narrower one, the one that we're looking at now, is prefaced with an M dot to signify mobile. And this might have made sense when, when the iPhone first came out and everybody was so excited about it and uh, marketing departments were scrambling to say, hey, we need to we need to wedge our big desktop site down into an experience that's a little bit more sensible uh, on a tiny screen that has touch interaction. And, uh, you know, redoing an entire mature desktop design uh, website is not something that you can just do overnight. So it sort of makes sense that, uh, that people might think of this as a workaround to create a unique URL for the experience. Uh, but. Uh, I and I think uh, Tim Berners-Lee would agree that content should be uniquely addressable across all devices. Everyone should be looking at, at the same content, the same URL. So I'm not saying the same design is the same URL, but the content, which is separate from the design, should be the same. As fragmentation increases, device and platform fragmentation increases, the m.example.com approach is going to become increasingly dif difficult to sustain. So I think that uh, using uh, a technique like responsive web design to provide uniquely addressable content is better for the web and therefore, you know, the general population who's on the web, uh, but it's also less work for web designers and developers because you don't have to maintain two separate websites.
I think Jeremy Keith put it best. Uh, he said that, to paraphrase, paraphrase uh, that M.DOT sites have been useful because of the state of our desktop sites, but device-specific URLs should be recognized for what they are, which is a temporary workaround. I will concede that there are, um, there's potentially an exception to this, and I, I would say uh, web apps uh, are, fall into a slightly different category. And this is kind of a slippery slope because there's no clear distinction between what is a website and what is a web app. Uh, but it's it's kind of like the, the judge says, I know it when I see it. Um, the canonical example for me is a web app called Bag Check that was created by Luke W. Uh, it was recently acquired by Twitter. And they specifically decided to use different URL structure for their mobile site and for their desktop site. And they had their reasons um, primarily because they wanted, they weren't presenting the same content at, at, at at two dif different uh, URLs. So it wasn't that they had exact same URL except for the www was replaced by m. Uh, they actually wanted the navigation and everything to be different in the mobile site. So it was a completely different experience. And in cases like that, when you are building a web app and you have, um, you have some kind of design goal or business goal that warrants different URL structures, uh, I'm, I'm not going to chase you down uh, and yell at you. But if you have a blog or some kind of news outlet or you're essentially publishing content, um, you are going to, I think in the long run, you're going to find that the best move is to have uniquely addressable content, keep your URL structure the same, uh, and uh, allow people to share those more easily, uh, not, not having to redirect them to different sites depending on what they're on, because that will just turn into a losing battle. Okay, so responsive web design specifically, what is it? Uh, basically, it's a collection of techniques that allow us to create web experiences that magically reformat themselves based on the presentation context. And some of the tools involved are media queries and fluid grids and adaptive images and this sort of thing. Uh, this term was coined by Ethan Marcotte, and he wrote the definitive article on responsive web design for a list apart, uh, I guess a little over a year ago. Now, he, he didn't invent the techniques, of course, but he gave the collection the name uh, based on responsive architecture. And it kind of stuck a lot like uh, when Jesse James Carrot kind of named the, the mishmash of tools we were uh, using. He called it Ajax, and all of a sudden it sort of caught on and, and became something that was more easy to talk about. So uh, that's where we're at with that. So interestingly, um, we've, we've been building device-specific sites all along without even knowing it. Uh, obviously, if you've been developing on the web for, you know, five, ten years, you know that we have we still, to a certain extent, have browser fragmentation uh, on the desktop. But in general, the hardware was pretty consistent, if you think about it. Got a minimum resolution, which we all, you know, we slowly crept up from 800 by 600 to 1024 by 768, where everybody was kind of like looking at each other as like, is it okay for me to, you know, have a higher minimum resolution for my site? Uh, bandwidth is another issue that uh, was fairly consistent on laptops and desktops. You were basically either online or you weren't. And we crept up, you know, it was dial-up at first, but we crept up to broadband. So if you, if you have a desktop and it's connected to the Internet, it's probably on a pretty fast connection. And it's probably also on an all-you-can-eat model connection where, you know, you don't have to worry about data caps. Uh, pixel density was consistent. Um, you could generally assume that someone had a mouse pointer of some kind, either a trackball or a... a, a a trackpad or a mouse, and there was a keyboard. Uh, there'd be a large amount of storage space on all of these devices, plenty of memory for web browsing, and power consumption generally wasn't something that we had to worry about. Obviously, laptops are battery powered, but um, unless you had flash on your site, there wasn't really a lot you could do to eat up someone's battery. Now, contrast that with what we have now, which we have every different screen size from uh, the size of a postage stamp up to a, a wall-sized TV screen. We've got different pixel densities. We've got touch and gesture input, soft keyboards, voice, trackball, D-pads, bandwidth considerations, um, intermittent connectivity. It's not just on or off. We might have 
we might have GPS, we might not. We might have Internet, we might not. We might be on 3G, we might be on Wi-Fi. There's all sorts of crazy things uh, around connectivity. Um, uh, battery life is something that a web developer can now smoke <laughs> with, their, with their programming, so we have to be um, cognizant of, of not using up people's batteries. And we've got a wide variety of just plain old usage context. Uh, with a desktop or a laptop, it was safe to assume the person was probably sitting down. They probably had both their hands free, but that's not the case anymore with mobile. So we've got all of these new considerations to worry about. So until recently, we've been, uh, speaking for myself, and I think a lot of people are the same way, when I, when I sat down to build a website, pictured the browser window as like a blank canvas, probably, you know, 900 pixels wide or so, and I would fill it with content. But with, with all of this crazy diversity of devices, we have to flip this notion on its head and just approach the whole thing differently. You have to think of your content in, as, as your product. The content is the product, not the layout that it's delivered in. The content is the product, and it needs to be, you need to conceive of it in chunks, not pages, because you don't know how it's going to flow into the uh, delivery container. It's good to define your atomic unit, so for a lot of people this will be a story or maybe a post. And you want to store that content in a CMS that is truly a content management system and not a web publishing tool. And the difference there is that um, a, a real true CMS isn't going to embed layout instructions or presentation instructions in with the data, pollute the data with things like rich text formatting or uh, HTML tags. Those things need to be separate because you don't know necessarily where your content is going to end up. So I could go on. This, this slide itself could be its own presentation, so I'm just going to move on. But uh, it, this really responsive web design does, to, do, to, to embrace it and do it successfully, you need to change your notion of the way that you develop for the web. The good news is that it's uh, not rocket science. Concepts are pretty straightforward. Um, at a high level, it basically involves using uh, liquid layouts, so relative units, media queries, adaptive images, to create layouts that just reflow in a pleasing way, depending on how much room you have to work with, and various other constraints. But it's definitely not a silver bullet, and it can be hard to implement, especially if you're starting with a crufty old desktop site that uh, you know has two million social sharing widgets and uh, ad network widgets and all these things that we've come to um, be familiar with on the desktop web. It's also difficult if your uh, CMS is polluted with HTML because then you know how do you scrub that out uh, and deal with that. Um, the Canvas first habit is very difficult to, it's a difficult, difficult habit, uh, habit for designers to break. Uh, and another thing that uh, is, seems to be a common problem is that marketing departments will just refuse to accept the fact that pixel perfection is a fool's errand and that, you know, it, 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 if, you, if you think your browser is pixel perfect, you, that just means you haven't tested in enough places. Um, Pixel perfection doesn't exist on the web. If you, if you want pixel perfection, write a book. The web is not, not for pixel perfect. So I want to take a quick look at the Boston Globe. So the Boston Globe site, uh, bostonglobe.com, was recently refreshed and is, is, I think, the biggest example of a mainstream, a large mainstream site that has uh, aggressively embrace responsive web design. So Ethan Marcotte and the Filament Group and a few others uh, built this or, or behind this redesign. And here uh, on this slide 16, I'm showing a screenshot of Media Queries. Uh, it's uh, a website that, um, that collects and displays uh, attractive responsive web designs. And you can sort of see by the uh, screenshot there that on the left-hand side, you've got a, sort of a, a, very, a small, narrow column layout. And then if you as you increase the browser size, 
uh, if you view this in your desktop browser, you can increase the, the window size and the page will just reformat itself from one column to two, then to three, and then to a larger version of three with more images. And this is, so these, these one, two, three, four screenshots that are on this slide all came from the same URL. So let's look at uh, some source code to see what the nuts and bolts of this look like. Uh, I'm putting up a link there for you to visit um, if you want to view source on this as I'm going through it uh, so that you don't have to, you know, we can only so sh show so much code in the slides, so you might want to take a deeper look into it uh, and you can view it at that URL. And I'll show you quickly what the, the if, if loaded in a browser, what this would look like. So here I've got my browser window narrowed down pretty small, and you can see this sort of linear layout, uh, just this vertical layout, one column layout. And then as you, as you increase the size of the browser a little bit, uh, I just throw in, uh, I, I take three of the uh, elements and display them in three columns across the front. And then once you have more room, start to add a little bit of, uh, little bit of flair with some additional icons. And this is certainly not meant to, um, you know, show off my design skills. This is really, when you look at the code, you'll see that I kept it extremely simple, left a lot of things out just to focus on the, uh, the issue at hand. So moving on, the, the directory would look like this if you, uh, if you poke around in there. You've got an index.html file, which is the, the main page, of course. Then there's a CSS folder and an images folder. And uh, inside the CSS folder, you've got default.css, enhanced.css that we're going to look at a little bit. And then inside the images folder, there are a series of images, uh, and you can see, you know, underscore 32, underscore 64. So I've got these uh, different images at multiple resolutions, and this is going to be important for retina displays, which we'll see in a few minutes. Uh, while we're here, I want to share a couple of thoughts about overall approach to developing uh, a, a site these days. And this is this can be difficult to do, like I said, if you've got an existing desktop site. But if you're starting from scratch, it's amazingly, um, it, it's like a wonderful feeling. Uh, it reminds me of back in the day when we all kind of agreed that uh, that that uh, layouts table-based layouts um, was a problem. And we, where everybody was basically doing table layouts, and that was just the way you did it. And it started to, I guess it was Jeff Zeldman that kind of, um, kind of promoted the approach of using CSS instead of tables to design our layouts. And, and if you remember making that switch, it was painful at first because, you know, you weren't used to it and there were sort of like layout bugs all over the place, and we had all these hacks to make it work. And I can remember personally saying, oh, man, why, why am I spending four hours trying to do something with CSS that it could have been done in five minutes with tables? But after some time goes by, and, you know, you maintain these sites, the CSS-based sites instead of table, table layout sites, you, you realize what the benefit is, which is that it's just really easy to maintain, your code is so much more clean, your pages are a lot lighter. There are so many benefits that are not immediately apparent because table layouts were working. Uh, and I, I find that responsive web design, and basically web design today, is going through a similar shift where um, it might be a little painful at first to get some of these concepts working and it might involve changing your workflow around a little bit and changing the way that you approach uh, design. Uh, perhaps relaxing some control, um, but the benefits are huge. And I think once you once you do it, there'll be no looking back. You'll wonder how you ever did it any other way. Uh, and so that was all prefaced for what I'm about to say, which is um, my process for starting from scratch with this site. So the first thing I do is I make sure that uh, my HTML will make sense with no style sheet. So it's not like div soup in there. I actually uh, do my best to um, set up the document uh, as semantically as possible using tags that are going to be recognized by all browsers so that if 
I'm on an extremely underpowered device uh, and the CSS isn't, isn't happening, then, um, you know, it's still usable. It's still readable content. Then what we'll do is layer on a default CSS. So that would be, that's in, in this case, it's named default.css. And that's going to be all your base, very, very base styles that would be common everywhere. So things, mostly typography and colors, uh, maybe some basic layout stuff like a little bit of margin and padding, uh, and maybe some, uh, potentially some borders, little tiny things that are going to work all over the place uh, and, 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 you know, take you one step up from that raw HTML experience. So then enhance.css is where the media queries start coming in. So in there, which we'll take a look at, I start to, I start to, um, I allow default to stay where it is. So I, I allow cascade, the cascade to work, you know, cascading style sheets. And then I just enhance the experience for uh, devices that are greater than a certain um, pixel width or, you know, and I have different breakpoints in there that we'll look at. Um, but the advantage, the, what, the point I want to make is that the advantage of having a default CSS uh, file that doesn't have any media queries allows you to provide a nice experience for browsers that don't support media queries at all. So instead of having, uh, you'll see some people who are new to media queries um, starting with like a desktop layout and then and, and then using media queries to strip stuff out of the desktop layout to um, to make it sort of mush it down into mobile. But I think the, re the reverse is much easier, and it's it's uh, I think you'll like it better. And it's much more successful to start with the the mobile design first, or the or air quotes ev the everywhere design, the general branding stuff, and the default style sheet, and then work your way up to larger sizes. All right, so enough talking about the theory. Let's look at an, what an actual media query looks like. So as you can see, uh, this is uh, this is enhanced.css, the enhanced.css file. And it starts off uh, with at media screen, which might be familiar to you if you've ever written a print style sheet. This is, uh, if you wanted to have print styles, you would do so in the same sort of fashion. But here, I've additionally got this and min width. 600 pixels. So what this is saying is that for um, for devices or windows really for windows that are wider than 600 pixels, then the rules that are embedded inside or nested inside of this media query are going to um, become true or they're going to become active. So I can't scroll down in here, uh, but you'll see if you look in the, the link that I posted, you can scroll down and get it. There's not a lot of rules in there. It's pretty straightforward. Um, there's nothing really unusual about it except for that it's nested inside of that media query. So moving on to the next, uh, a little farther down in the page, that same page, enhance.css, I set another breakpoint at 900 pixels. So I say, okay, at 900 pixels, um, I want you know the header to be taller, and I want to uh, move the logo over to the left, and et cetera, et cetera. Again, I, I might be overriding some defaults that were uh, some some rules that were in the default style sheet, but in, I'm going to try to uh, let them cascade as much as possible, so I can write less CSS and it's more um, it, it's more robust. So let's take a second to look through um, this chunk of CSS where I've got the, uh, this, this is a three column section in the middle. Uh, and at this point in the code, so lines 59 through 70, I'm nested inside of the, uh, the, the 900 or greater layout, uh, the 900 or greater media query. And I've got the three columns. And I want to add the background images you might remember from the screenshot. There are uh, three little icons that go with each feature. So I use background images to do that, and that's nothing special. Um, you can see the URLs pointing to the image directory and the form puzzle and heart uh, PNGs. Uh, you can see, probably it's probably implied, but uh, if you actually open those files, you'll see that they're 32 pixels square. And I am explicitly stating that in the background size here. So 
that if you're familiar with how background images work, you will know that that's redundant and that I didn't have to do that, but you'll see uh, in a minute that uh, there actually is a reason why I'm explicitly setting the background size uh, at a one-to-one -one ratio. Okay, so moving along to, now here's another kind of media query. So on line 74, uh, you can do a pixel ratio query, and this is this essentially is saying uh, if I'm on a, a retina device, more or less. So if uh, if my min device pixel ratio is two, I want to use a different background image for the logo. I want the higher resolution one, and this is this might not make sense unless you're familiar with the way that uh, the the web browser works on iOS. So on the new Retina iPad and the iPhone 4 and greater, the the resolution is double previous versions. And if you know because of because an image is a fixed uh, bitmap, it has a certain number of images in it. Browsing, uh, looking at an image on on a website on a Retina device would, you know, this the fonts will scale up because that's vector, but the images would be you know, half size. So they'd all be like shrunk down in, well, really a quarter of their actual size. So what the browser does is it automatically scales them up. And this creates a, a, a noticeably blurry effect on the images. So what I'm doing here is providing a double resolution uh, image and, and the browser, the iOS browser, knows that if I'm specifying a background size, then don't mess around with the scaling. So in other words, you're saying, I'm handling it, don't worry, you don't have to do any uh, automatic scaling. So that's how you, you make your uh, images, that's how you set up your images to be high res, essentially, for retina screens. And this is quite noticeable uh, if, when you see it. So now moving on to the next one, we've got uh, high-res graphics for retina screens wider than 900 pixels, all right? So uh, lines 81 and 82, I, I, uh, I put a carriage return in there, uh, which I don't think will, uh, to tell you the truth, I don't know if that will actually work like that. In the real file, I just did it so we could see it in the slide. In the real file, that's all one line. So the line would be media screen and min width 900 pixels and WebKit min device pixel ratio to that all be on one line. And here what I'm doing is uh, I'm putting in high resolution versions of the uh, those three feature icons using um, you know using the device pixel ratio and uh, I since above I put a background size of 32 it's automatically going to know that I want these to be displayed at at the logical 32 pixels so that so in other words, since the background size has been set for these, it's going to behave appropriately. So it's not going to, you know, res them up, so to speak. It's going to, uh, it'll just work. So while we're talking about images, um, there is, so these are, these are CSS-based uh, image URLs. So in the CSS, we're, you know, we've got these media queries that we can use, and we can point uh, to different different graphics automatically without having to do any JavaScript or anything like that. You literally just resize the window and uh, the new images will, the images will appear and disappear and, and change one to the other. Uh, it's, it's great. Uh, the, an issue, however, is with the image tag itself. So if you have, uh, in your HTML, you've got an image tag that is, you know, it's part of the content more than the design. It's uh, a screenshot, for example. The screenshot uh, uh, on this page, actually, is an example. You, you have potentially an issue. So what I'm doing in the CSS to make that image scale up and down as the browser window resizes is just set the width to 100%. And the aspect ratio is maintained, and it, uh, it scales up and down. But that means that, you know, for people who are viewing uh, on, let's say, a screen that's only 320 pixels wide, they're getting like a 900 pixel wide image, 
for no reason, and then you know making the browser scale it down to 25% of its actual size or so. So that's a, you know a waste of bandwidth. I could have served them up if I could have served them up a more appropriately sized image or a correctly sized image for their context. That would have been really nice. But it's it's non-trivial to make that happen. Uh, there are a number of different approaches, but I wouldn't say that there's there's no clear winner. Uh, it sort of depends on your situation, your goals, your use cases, the amount of content you have, the amount of images, how they're how you're using them, how high resolution you want them to appear, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there, and, and the the terms are all over the map. There's um, uh, adaptive images and tiny source and uh, you know JavaScript replacement and no script hacks and all these different things um, that it's it's an emerging it is no clear winner really it's an emerging uh, question perhaps your approach would be to just use the high resolution Im uh, images and so sure you're sending bigger images down to your users but um, you know you've got a single request uh, not two requests like some other some other approaches will download uh, first download low res images and then uh, using JavaScript on the client detect whether there is a um, you know, enough real estate for the high-res image or maybe a retina screen and then fetch a larger image and replace the smaller image. And there are just so many, so many trade-offs that I, I can't really recommend one approach over the other. Um, but the, probably the two to look at um, as you're investigating how to handle the image tag would be um, uh, Sencha.io source which is uh, is the the new version of tiny source and and also the other thing to look at is adaptiveimages.com it's adaptive-images.com and these two things uh, i think are are the way uh, approach the way that we're going to have to deal with this for the interim the time being while the, well potentially the w3c works out what to do with the image tag or or some better solution comes from the browser vendors where we can set the resolution that we want um, but the notion is that the client side and the server side work together to create a profile for the device, the, the browsing device, and and the server figures out what to do uh, and serves up. The, so in other words, the image sort of becomes dynamic on the on the server side, and the client really just kind of identifies what features it's capable of, what what features it possesses, and. Um, and the server deals with it on the other end, but there's just there's just really no one clear winner. So those are things to look at um, as you're thinking through your strategy for handling images on your site. Um, I have a ton of links, uh, responsive web design tweets that I've been sending out uh, yesterday, today, and I'm going to continue to send out that um, revolve around all of these topics. Um, there's there's a lot to cover, but uh, I you know this is a boot camp. I want to keep it really basic, and just wanted to show that the uh, you know media queries are actually it's it's not rocket science like I said. You just need to um, you know I, I think if you take the approach of starting with uh, mobile first and and having the default styles be for mobile, and then work your way up from there, you're going to find that. This is actually really pretty easy um, and, and is something that you can get your head around real quickly as, you know, if you're starting from scratch. Uh, once you've got that under your belt, you probably have an easier time re-architecting desktop sites that need to have a, a more pleasing mobile experience. Uh, the last thing I'm going to mention while I'm on this slide is that, uh, is that you can see I'm using pixels for the min width on line 81. And in fact, um, recently, it's I'm still experimenting with it, but it probably would make more sense to use M's there. And the the, the idea of an M is that it's a relative measure, and uh, can accommodate for situations where the user is going to uh, zoom their text. So if you, in general. Um, 1m equals 16 pixels, uh, but if you if you if the user zooms in their browser, then that that changes everything, and these breakpoints will get screwed up because 
the images and, and, and fonts and everything else that I've defined is going to reflow strangely. So uh, I'm actually going to, let's see here. Yeah, I'm going to back up a couple slides. I'm going to go to slide 24, something I meant to point out. So on slide 24, you can see on line 35, with a header, a, a height at 4 M's. And what this allows uh, the user to do is to zoom their browser so that the text and everything is going to increase appropriately. If I had set that to say, um, you know, 50 or 60 pixels, then the text would increase, uh, but the, the space for the text would not increase. So you do, one of the uh, big things with responsive design is you want to use relative units wherever you can. Uh, you can see a bit farther down, I've got the header, the width of the, uh, the A tag in the header on line 41. I've got that set to pixels, but that's because I'm putting a pixel image, I'm using image replacement there for the text. So uh, it, it's okay to use the pixels there because the image isn't gonna size up. Um, there are other places where you can't use M's or it's weird, like border width. Uh, size, setting that in M's looks really strange when you zoom up because your borders get really big. And if, for me, it, it doesn't look pleasing. Um, maybe, maybe you feel differently, but um, that's where I'll tend to use just a one pixel so that, you know, as a width so that when it zooms up, it's still just a fine rule. And you might think that, um, you might think that people don't zoom their browsers and, and that may or may not be true. I, I, you know, I, I know plenty of people who, who do zoom their browsers, um, but there's actually a bigger issue, which is that uh, Android devices and a lot of these new smart TVs automatically default to a large zoom. So for example, I've got a Google TV and if you view it, um, you know, it's a big screen, but it presumes that you're sitting 10 feet across the room. So it's, it's actually fairly low resolution, all things considered, and it zooms the text by default uh, to be quite large. So that um, breaks a lot of layouts if they are set in pixels and the, and the text gets zoomed up. So uh, it does require a fair amount of math, but you do want to use uh, M's for your, um, for your measurements wherever possible. And if you look at that default.css, you can see that uh, I think throughout we use M's for uh, everything possible. Okay, so here are a couple of links that uh, that you can check out. And again, I, I probably there's probably 20, 20 more links in my Twitter feed if you want to uh, check that there. Um, we've got uh, uh, this, uh, as you said at the beginning, this recording will be available for download. And you're also welcome to uh, ping me on Twitter with any questions, but we do have plenty of time for questions now. So if uh, folks want to send things in through the chat, I'm sure Yasmina would uh, forward those to me. You can talk through those. All right, we do have several questions that have come in, Jonathan. And folks, as Jonathan said, please type your questions into the group chat, send them in, and we'll take those while we still have them with us. Uh, let's take a peek here. Would you like me to read them to you, or did you want to take a peek, Jonathan? Uh, with the Q&A tab? Yes. Um, let's see. Okay, so what is your policy on using M's versus percentages? So that's a good question. Uh, I tend to I'm still playing around with it, honestly. Um, I, I tend to use percentages more for like, uh, like a block element that I want to, or an absolute position element. And I use M's more for things like um, padding and, and text uh, sizes, font size. But it's, it's something I'm, I'm playing with. I think I lean I think it pretty much breaks down like that, though. You know, where I'm setting a width of a column type of thing, uh, percentages is what I reach for. But 
I think they both work. It's just a question of how much math you want to do. Trying to scroll this here. So here's a good question I don't think I have a good answer for, but uh, it, in a situation where responsive design and web ads must coexist, how to approach that in existing site examples. So this is a huge issue, and like I said, I, I don't think I've got a good answer for you, but I do think it's worth raising. Um, if you are including, you know, uh, either iframes or JavaScripts or whatever from other sites like an ad network or, or that sort of thing, or even the Facebook like button, you need to really, really be careful with that and test it and, um, and, and it's obviously if you, if you have ads in your site, you need to have ads in your site. That's probably how you're making your revenue. But um, something as simple as a Facebook like button creates like 20 or 30 new HTTP requests. So you just include this one line of JavaScript and all of a sudden you've got like a massive, you know, number of network requests that are out of your control and can really strongly impact the load time. Um, you go to half of these sites like, you know, I don't know, just a, like a popular tech blog, and there'll be so many sharing widgets and ads and everything else that even on the desktop, it'll take like 10 or 15 seconds for the page to finish loading, if it ever even finishes. Um, and on mobile, that just does not cut it. Uh, you need to, you know, Google has done extensive testing, uh, you know, around speed and the difference between response times and milliseconds can make a, a noticeable significant difference in bounce rates. So if you, you know, obviously if you have ads, you need to show ads, but, uh, you know, if you, you, have to, you have to weigh the, uh, the load time with the, uh, the value of the ads that you're providing. So I just, I just wanted to, like, talk through that a little bit and, and make sure that's on people's minds. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Um, yeah, a couple more questions about advertising. So here's a question. I can understand creating these media queries ensure a better presentation to the user instead of just using a fluid layout. But is this overhead really worth it to most users? I mean, that's, uh, you know, it depends, right? It depends on what you're trying to do. Um, I, I think it's worth it. It's, it's when, you're, when you do have the luxury of starting from scratch, it's really easy. Um, I think it's, it's much easier than a lot of the, uh, some, you know, the sort of late 90s, uh, early 2000s, some of the liquid layout stuff that we were trying to do. Um, I remember that being really hard. Obviously, I, I was less experienced with CSS, but, but something about floats and all of that, it was just like, I don't know, it was, it was I found it really confusing and unpredictable. Uh, but the media queries is really pretty straightforward. Um, so I think, I think it's, uh, it depends on your site, what you're trying to do and what your users are expecting, but uh, uh, I find it pleasing. Um, I find it pleasing and I think it's easy, so. I guess that's my answer. I think in most cases it probably is worth it. Uh, here's a question. I thought using the universal asterisk selector has performance implications. Um, that's probably true. Uh, I don't know the answer to that, uh, to tell you the truth. It, it would make sense that it would have performance implications. I should probably be more specific in the style sheet there. Um, but, uh, you know, if this was, uh, you know, it's, it's an exam, it's example code. So yeah, perhaps I shouldn't have put that in, but, um, you know, folk, it, the, the idea is to focus on the media queries in here and, um, and to do, you know, that's the focus of the talk. So I didn't spend a ton of time worrying about that sort of stuff. So I apologize for that. Uh, question, how much extra cost is associated with uh, a responsive web design approach versus just building a fluid layout? I, I don't think it's an either or proposition. Um, you can, within the breakpoints that you have here, I think it makes a lot of sense to, to you know, use a fluid layout, or to use fluid, fluid layout concepts or liquid layout concepts 
um, for things to, uh, you know, reflow in between the breakpoints. Um, and the Boston Globe site there, they get super, super picky with the um, font sizes at, at all sorts of different breakpoints. Um, so I think, I, I think that you can use both together. Uh, the media queries for me is just a little bit more predictable and easy. It, for me, it's a little bit easier having uh, some breakpoints in there. Uh, apart from bostonglobe.com, what big media sites are doing responsive well? Uh, so this, I think, is still emerging, um, but the, the, the best place to go to find um, Information, you know, to sort of keep up to date on what sites are using responsive web design appropriately or well, uh, is just just uh, follow the RSS feed on media queries, which is you know .es. It's not mediaqueries.com, but it's on that on the, the links slide when you download the slides. Um, there are not as many as I'd like to see, and I think the reason for that is that it's so difficult to go from a a mature site that was built specifically for desktop, the desktop experience, um, it's very difficult to reverse engineer it into responsive web design. And I'm, I'm the first to admit it. Um, the CMS is probably all crufty with HTML and CSS in line and all sorts of probably WYSIWYG tools that, um, you know, are, it's very difficult to go from there to, you know, a nice, clean, responsive sites starting with mobile first and working your way up. So I, I think it's going to take time uh, for these uh, examples to emerge. Um, hasn't building from the content out always been the advice from the layered semantic markup camp? Uh, I, I suppose that's true, but I am not even talking about, I'm not even talking about markup. So even before markup, um, you should be thinking about your content in a markup-less environment. So, for example, uh, NPR, I think, did a great example with their um, Create Once Publish Everywhere platform, often abbreviated as COPE, uh, where they, they have tons of examples of, of situations where they output their data, their content, in places where HTML rendering isn't even an option. So they have to store their content without tags at all, it's just plain text. And if it was input with tags in the first place, you know, say like links are probably a good example, uh, that is stripped out, it's saved, but it's also stripped out for the plain text version um, at the point of entry. And they keep track of where the tags were in the plain text if they need to insert them back in. So it's, uh, content first is, is um, web, it's agnostic completely to the way I'm talking about it. It's not necessarily for the web. Obviously, we're talking about web today, but I think your CMS should be prepared to output uh, to any environment, maybe uh, send, out, send out content over SMS or some other non-HTML environment. Uh, so I guess there's a little bit of a distinction there. Uh, so. Another question, what's the best way to handle multiple column tables, i.e. sports standings and stats and responsive design? So I'm going to assume that this person is specifically asking about HTML tables. Uh, and my experience with that is, you know, you can, um, so actually on my site I have this. I have a list of uh, talks that uh, or I had. I had a list of talks that was laid out in a table format because it's, it's data and it's, it was a grid data. I, I've since changed it because it was, I, I, I like the look of something new better, but um, the table itself, when, I, when, I, when it was set up for it to be responsive, uh, as I had it scroll down, as the window got smaller and smaller, uh, I had the, the padding and the font sizes decreased and there were columns of data that were less important than others. So when I got down to the, the narrowest uh, width I was going to support, which is 320 pixels, um, I just hid some of the columns. So you can't really hide a column, but, you know, if you hide the, all the TDs, the first, you know, the, you can use the uh, um, nth child to hide, like, uh, the first TD in each row. And that was how I, I made that work. 
Uh, let's see. So here's a uh, here's an interesting question. Won't your approach for retina displays mean the phone users would have to download the small graphic and then download the larger graphic double penalty? So, uh, you know, I haven't tested that to tell you the truth. So um, the approach to that, if it turns out that that's true, and I have a feeling you are right about that, um, when you what you can do is use max width instead of min width. Or, sorry, you can use max width in addition to min width. Um, and if you want to be really surgical about downloading uh, just the image you need for the resolution, uh, you could say um, put all of your all of your background image uh, media queries in uh, pixel ratio, you know, min and max pixel ratios. If you do want to prevent that, but uh, I'll actually test. I'm, I'm almost positive that uh, who asked this, Daniel Venditelli. Sorry about that. I'm sure I butchered that, Venditelli. Um, I'll actually test that and tweet it out later. I, I'm pretty sure you're right, actually, and that uh, that they'll both get downloaded. So if you do want to prevent that, which is probably a good idea, you can uh, uh, use the pixel ratio. And let me refresh this. I think that's everything. Okay, so a couple more questions. So best technique for handling media queries with browsers that don't support media queries. Um, so that, that's what I was getting at with the, um, with the designing for mobile first. Because the browsers that don't support media queries are generally on mobile phones. They're, you know, small. Uh, and you're going to have, you're going to be delivering an experience to them just by the default style sheet so, uh, that has no media queries in it. So if that's, uh, so you're going to want to put um, whatever, whatever styles that you want core across the entire uh, site in there. And then as the screen real estate gets larger and larger and the media queries are supported, of course, then you can layer in these new rules for the uh, more higher powered browsers, more modern browsers. Uh, here's another question. Have you seen any enterprise solutions that do responsive web design well? Uh, I I haven't. They might be out there. Uh, I haven't seen it, but I suspect that um, you know it's the same. It's the same with the question about large media sites that have done responsive web design. You know, other than the Globe, Boston Globe, who else has done it? And you know, the large enterprises, all large enterprises, including media companies, are they're in a situation where their systems grew up in the '90s. Their web systems grew up in the '90s and the early 2000s, and they were developing for desktops and laptops. And, you know, it's, it's hard. I've worked with uh, a number of Fortune 2000 companies that are just struggling with mobile because their systems just aren't set up for the scenario that mobile presents. Uh, their systems are not real time. They're polluted with layout instructions in the, in the, in the CMS. Uh, they have, you know, they're running nightly batch scripts to sync up different systems that don't talk to each other and it's uh, it's a lot uh, if you if you have the luxury of starting from scratch it's super easy but if you don't then you end up with all sorts of hacks and workarounds like the you know the M dot solution and uh, and that sort of thing and I understand that you know you, know, you got to get your job done at the end of the day and if you have to use a hack you have to use a hack but it just should be recognized as one I think so no I haven't seen any enterprise solutions Uh, someone else has a SharePoint question. I've never worked with that, so sorry, I don't know. Uh, so that seems like that seems like all the questions. Um, if you have more questions, um, please pin me on Twitter. Uh, you can see it looks like the slide is still up. Uh, Jonathan Stark, and you can uh, and, and I'm also going to update the 
the file with that um, the media query to not download the smaller images and the high-res images. So that was a good question.